Okay, in this video we're going to be looking at the English accents that you will be expected to know in the IELTS exam. Remember, IELTS stands for International English Language Testing System, so it has to be international. Therefore, it's not just going to be British English, it's not just going to be American English, it's not just going to be Australian English. It's going to be one of those three main ones because those are the, the largest um, the largest, say, populations of English speakers around the world. Of course, there's large numbers of Irish uh, speakers, there's a large number of South African English speakers, as well as New Zealand uh, English speakers. And there are some people in, for example, Singapore, who only speak English, but those tend not to have um, so many uh, voice actors in the IELTS exam. The main ones, as you can see, 30% for, for each of them, for British, Australian and American. We will talk briefly about um, about 10% that comes up in the non-English accents as well. But let's start with the British accent. Okay, so um, the British accent is sort of divided up into the most common one, which is the RP. RP stands for Received Pronunciation, um, also known as BBC English, and that's the English you will hear um, in English course books and things like that. And, and that's, when I say British English in the IELTS exam, that is the accent you are going to hear most probably uh, in the exam. Um, however, there are sometimes cases where they bring in more regional accents. So um, I've studied, to do this video, I studied 20 exams and took notes of all 20 exams um, and which accents came up in those 20 exams. So some of them were um, Northern or General Northern English or Scottish, but mild forms of them, not very strong. So it's still easy to, generally easy to hear um, what they are saying. And then there was a London accent, um, a Cockney accent, or sometimes known as an estuary English. Now things have changed. A lot of poor people have moved to the east of London. Not poor people, but formerly, uh, let's say, uh, working class English, uh, British English people have moved to the east, so that's called called estuary English, and it's um, th there's some interesting features of that, and we're going to talk about those, and then w from Wales and West Country uh, accents as well, which we'll talk about. But let's start with the baseline accent, um, and that is RP or BBC English. Okay, so um, as I said, this is the accent that you're going to hear in English course books made by OUP, so Oxford University Press, CUP, Cambridge University Press, uh, Pearson Longman. If you've ever used any English course books from the UK, these are the accents you're going to hear. And when I say it's a baseline accent, I mean this is what we will be referring back to compared to the other accents. So for example, when, when we talk about the American accent, because I'm actually I'm South African, but I've lived in the UK for long enough to know what the RP accent sounds like. What I will say is that the American accent has got a, they, they pronounce the R at the end of the word, for example, the word teacher. In British um, RP English, it's teacher, teacher, but in American English, teacher. And so what I'll be pointing out is that the Americans pronounce the R so I'm using the RP or BBC English as the baseline for all the rest of the accents in this video. So what we'll do now is we'll listen to this woman um, in the dialogue here. Um, take, um, take note that the man has got an American accent, but what we're looking for is just the standard RP accent of this woman. So let's listen. And tell me how many bedrooms you're looking for. Well... We'd need four because I'm going to share the house with three friends. OK. There are several of that size on our books. They mostly belong to families who are working abroad at the moment. What about the location? It'd be nice to be central. Oh, that might be difficult, as most houses of that size are in the suburbs. Still, there are a few. What's your upper limit for the rent? Okay, so that's the uh, um, a woman speaking to an, an American man. And you'll notice, for example, the word upper. Upper, what's your upper limit? 
for the rent. Now, upper, the R is at the end of the word, so it's not pronounced. If it was an American saying that word, they would say upper, upper. But British, upper. However, the R at the beginning of rent is pronounced rent. Okay, now let's listen to the man uh, speaking with RP or BBC English. Whales and dolphins sometimes swim ashore from the sea right onto the beach and, most often, die in what are known as mass strandings. Unfortunately, this type of event is a frequent occurrence in some of the locations that you'll be travelling to, where sometimes the tide goes out suddenly, confusing the animals. However, there are many other theories about the causes of mass strandings. OK, so just notice here, however, there are, are, not are, there are many other theories. And so it's other, other theories. The first is that the behaviour is linked to parasites. It's often found that stranded animals were infested with large numbers of parasites. For instance, a type of worm is commonly found in the ears of dead whales. Now, what you'll notice here is um, what we'll be looking at is the pronunciation in a video called Weak Forms. Um, and, sorry, actually the video will be related to connected speech. So the video that I'll release, I think it's in section four, um, which is connected speech, we look at what happens when a word ending on a consonant joins to a word that starts with a vowel sound. And in this case, we do hear the R. So for instance, for instance, listen again. It's often found that stranded animals were infested with large numbers of parasites. For instance, a type of worm is commonly found in the ears of dead whales. OK, for instance. And if you noticed, if you were clever, you would notice as well here, were rin, were rin fested. So the R is pronounced if the next word starts with a vowel sound. OK, let's finish this. Since marine animals rely heavily on their hearing to navigate, this type of infestation has the potential to be very harmful. OK. All right, so that's uh, the British English accent, and it's very important to get used to it, obviously, because it comes up quite, quite often in the IELTS exam. Now, we'll be looking at the Australian accent as well, which is not that different from British English, um, but there are some significant differences which we'll be talking about. OK, let's ca carry on to... Um, the more regional accents in Britain. Okay, in this case, you'll be listening to the woman specifically. Uh, the man won. Um, in fact, he's not entirely, uh, he's British, but he's not using the RP accent or the BBC English accent so much. He has got a sort of London accent. Um, it's not pure RP. And then man number two is American. OK, but sp uh, focus specifically on the woman. Now, she is the generic northern or Scottish accent. Maybe I'd better go through the article again, just to be sure. Can you remember what it was called? Sample Surveys in Social Science Research, I think, by Meta. M-E-H-T-A? Yeah. And he also recommended a more recent book called Sur survey Research by Bell, I think. It's in that series published by London University. And if we try to use interviews instead, I saw a book in the departmental library that'll be helpful. It's called Interviews That Work by Wilson, published in Oxford in 1988. Right. Oh, I've got a tutorial now. Can we meet up again later this week? What about Friday morning? Okay, so later this week, I mean, it's all, almost Irish. I'm not sure what she's trying to be here. Um, a lot of these are voice actors that don't na don't naturally speak this accent. Um, and so they're putting on an accent. And you'll notice this especially with the non-English uh, accents right at the end of this video. It's very infuriating to listen to it. But I, I think she's trying to be Scottish, maybe Irish. I'm not sure. Um what about Friday this morning? So it's it's a little bit... Let's listen again. Right. Oh, I've got a tutorial now. Can we meet up again later this week? What about Friday morning? Okay. Um, 
So the the Friday becomes Friday. So e, not a, e. Um, other than that, it's really the vowel sounds that shift. Um, the rest is quite similar to RP English. Um, as I said, this won't be. It's unlikely to come up um, the more regional English. But if it does, it's good to just be aware of the slight differences. But the rest really, it's quite similar to the uh, what you'd heard in the previous um, audio. And notice what they will do is dumb down or weaken the strength of regional accents. They would never make um, a purely regional accent that was almost impossible to understand because that would be unfair. Okay, now this is um, London, so, so this mild Cockney or estuary English. Um, which is um, typically associated with working class um, people. So this man is, he's running a football club for children. Um, so listen to the man and we'll, we'll stop the video when we notice differences in the accent. In a senior competition, there'll be four teams, same as last year. And their games will be played on Saturday afternoons, starting at 2.30. Okay, so the first notice here, it's not Saturday, it's Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. So the T um, becomes what is called a glottal stop. Sat. So the T is as if you're going, uh-oh. If you can make that sound, uh-oh, as if you, you say, oh, no, there's a mistake or there's a problem, you say, uh-oh. And that sound that you're, that is created by closing the back of your throat is the glottis, that's what it's called. So if the glottis is closing, the sound that is created instead of the T in Cockney or Estuary English is this uh sound or glottal stop. So let's listen to it again. In a senior competition, there'll be four teams, same as last year, and their games will be played on Saturday afternoons starting at 2.30 Okay, Saturday afternoons, but um, they have been told to make it mild. So instead of Saturday, he didn't say, two, he said 2.30, but in reality it would be 2.30, 30, But they've been told, the voice actor for this, to dumb down his strong Cockney accent. You'll also be noticing here that there, there, it's not there all. The L sound in Cockney becomes a W sound. So listen one more time. In a senior competition, there will be four. There will, there will be four teams. Teams. Okay, let's listen. Teams, same as last year. And their games will be played on Saturday afternoons starting at 2.30. Oh, no, uh, sorry. It will be at a two o'clock start. And the training session for seniors is planned for Sunday afternoons. Then there's David West, who's volunteered to be the... Okay, another thing you notice is that um, Cockney doesn't say who. It doesn't have the sound. It's just oo. Oo's, oo's volunteered. So the H, the W, here of course is not wahoo. So the W we can safely ignore. But it's who in RP or BBC English, but in Cockney it's ooh, ooh. So notice or listen out for another example, it's coming up. The club secretary, and one of the many jobs he'll have is to send out newsletters to you regularly. If you have any information that may be useful, please let David know so that it can be included in these newsletters. Also, I'd like to introduce you to Jason Dokic, who is the head coach. Okay, did you hear it? He's the Ed, not the head, the Ed, the Ed coach. Okay. For all the new members here tonight, this is the third year that Jason has been with us as head coach and... Notice in this case he says head, but previously here, as well as with who, the H is silent. We're very lucky to have such an experienced coach and former player at our club. He will continue to supervise the teams at training sessions and on match days. Okay, and that is the mild Cockney accent. Um, I'll be giving you some resources, uh, some examples of 
people speaking with these accents um, in the resources section so that you can get used to listening to them talking in these particular accents. Okay, let's go on to the next one, which is the Welsh or West Country. And you're going to be talking, listening to this woman. So when I say West Country, I mean generally um, towards Bristol. Um, and I'll show you on a map here. So this is the West Country here. Okay, let's listen. Mainline trains also offer direct services to Bristol, where you can visit the docks or spend a great day out with the children in the zoo, which is set in the parkland that used to surround the old castle. Okay, a lot of people say that, in fact, Welsh or West Country is one of the easiest um, accents to hear in English. Um, a lot of students prefer the Welsh accent to anything else because it's clearer. Um, and let me know if you believe, if you think this is the case. Um, notice this, the old, old castle, zoo, zoo, old castle. So it's a, it's a sort of a lot stronger than the more RP English would be zoo and old castle. It's, it's an old castle and zoo. Okay, listen for a uh, special. Uh, special family away day fairs are available for this service now during the school holidays. Uh, alternatively, you can be in Birmingham. In and look, notice the Welsh, uh, they don't, um, they often stress the, the final L-Y of adverbs. So alternatively, alternatively, it's uh, more stressed than typical um, BBC or RB, RP. Uh, alternatively, you can be in Birmingham in only an hour and a half where there's lots to see and do, including the new and internationally acclaimed Climbing Wall, built on the site of the old aquarium. Mm -hmm. We will also be running a special service to Newport when the new Science Museum opens next year, as we anticipate a lot of visitors in the opening weeks. A lot, sorry, that should be of. Anticipate a lot of visitors. A lot of a lot of visitors. Um, Welsh does tend to be quite a sing-song language, because um, a lot of Welsh speakers speak their late native language of Welsh as well, and it's a lot more sing-song than um, British or sorry than English by itself. So that has influenced their range of tones in the language compared to people who only speak English. I'd advise you to call early to book your tickets. Is that okay? I'll advise you to call early to book your tickets. I mean, it's it's quite sing-song. Okay, let's go on to the next one now. Okay, we're going to be looking at Australian and others. So other, when I say others, that means other accents in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, and we'll be looking at the weaker Australian accent, the stronger Australian accent, and then South African and Kiwi. Now... Um, this is in an informal way to say New Zealand, but interestingly enough, there is no way to say New Zealand as an adjective. So Australia, Australian, South Africa, South African, but there's no way to say New Zealanden. There's no adjective. The informal way to talk about people who are from New Zealand as an adjective is Kiwi. So that's what I mean here. Okay, let's go to the weaker Australian accent. Sharks vary in weight with size and breed, of course, but the heaviest shark caught in Australia was a white pointer. That weighed 795 kilograms. Quite a size. Sharks have a different structure to most fish. Instead of a skeleton made of bone, they have a tough, elastic skeleton of cartilage. Unlike bone, this firm, pliable material is rather like your nose, and allows the shark to bend easily as it swims. Okay, so what you'll notice here is it's quite similar to um, RP or BBC English, but um, this A sound becomes a lot longer. So it's not shark, it's shark. Not shark in British English, but shark. It's an R sound. Um, and Australian um, accents tend to be quite nasal, so a lot of the air released from somebody speaking with their Australian accent comes through the nose rather than the mouth. Shark. The shark's skin isn't covered with scales like other fish. Instead, the skin's covered with barbs giving... Barbs. 
in a rough texture like sandpaper. As you know, sharks are very quick swimmers. This is made possible by their fins, one set at the side and another set underneath the body, and the tail also helps the shark move forward quickly. Unlike other fish, sharks have to keep swimming if they want to stay at a particular depth, and they rarely swim at the surface. Mostly they swim at the bottom of the ocean, scavenging and picking up food that's lying on the ocean floor. While most other animals, including fish, hunt their prey by means of their eyesight, sharks hunt essentially by smell. Okay, so if you get a weaker accent from an Australian voice actor, then you shouldn't really have much trouble to understand. Okay, in this case, um, there's the, a stronger accent, particularly by the student. The woman hasn't got a strong accent, but the student does um, to a certain extent, especially towards the end of this dialogue. Okay, and it's split into two here, so um, we'll be listening for the first part and then listen for the second part and pay a particular attention to the student. Well, the library is big enough to incorporate the self-access centre, but it wouldn't be like a class activity anymore. Our main worry would be not being able to go to a teacher for advice. I'm sure there would be plenty of things to do, but we really need teachers to help us choose the best activities. Okay, so here we've got this R sound as well, not shark, it's no AR, but it's cl class, shark, class. And then again, we've got the Australian class, class coming through the nose, as well as an air sound, class, class activity. Okay, um, and listen to this activities, activities. Now this also happens in American English. If there is a vowel sound before the T and a vowel sound after the T, very often the T becomes a D sound. So activities, listen to it one more time. I'm sure there would be plenty of things to do, but we really need teachers to help us choose the best activities. Okay, activities. Now listen for the woman. She doesn't have um, such a strong accent and listen to the way she pronounces activities. Well, there would still be a teacher present and he or she would guide the activities of the students. We wouldn't just leave them to get on with it. Okay, so she, um, I don't know if she's been told by IELTS to drop her, um, the strength of that, activities, because it's confusing for some students, so she's been told, because then she goes on to actually use the same thing here with the T. Um, uh, so listen for the way she pronounces this T, following that same Australian rule with um, the T between two vowels. We wouldn't just leave them to get on with it. Get on, get on with it. So the, the T here becomes a D, even though she's supposed to have not such a strong accent. Okay, now let's continue with the student. Yes, but I think... But I think the students would be much happier keeping the existing set up. They really like going to the self-access centre with their teacher and staying together as a group to do activities. Okay, and now he's fixed himself and he's used not activities, but activities. Okay, so bear in mind this is what IELTS will do. They will use a voice actor that might not actually have an Australian accent, um, but they've been told to put it on and then turn it off occasionally, if, if especially if there's an answer, if that requires one of the answers, um, they'll make it much more clearer and not force you to try and work out what it is you are trying to say simply because you don't speak, um, and we don't understand the Australian accent. Okay, now this is the second uh, second bit of the dialogue, so let's listen for the woman first. What do you think of the idea of introducing some workbooks? If we break them up into separate pages and laminate them, they'd be a great resource. Okay, so listen to this one. It's not break, it's break. Break, break, and laminate. So break and laminate. Night, bray, nay. Okay, so this A sound, bray, in British English, laminate. Australian English, bray, laminate. If we break them up into separate pages and laminate them, they'd be a great resource. Okay, and also notice here, in British English, this word is pronounced resource different resources. The stress is on the first syllable, but in Australian English, the stress is on the second syllable. Listen to her again with this word. They'd be a great resource. 
okay, resource. Um, so also bear in mind that some words, and I'm going to point this out to you, especially in the American um, section, some words have different stress compared to British English. And um, so whether you're living in America right now and getting used to the British English or the opposite way around, it's important to notice the difference, uh, differences in accents and stresses between the two. Okay, let's continue with the sentence. The students could study the main course book in class and then do follow-up practice in the self-access centre. Okay, notice again we've got this mine, break, laminate, so this I sound mine, course book in class. Class, and this is the R sound, class. Okay, and then listen to the way the student says this word. In British English, it's good. It sounds good. Okay, and they say good. Good, it's, a, it's sort of a more oo sound, okay, but it's not, it's not going um, not gonna to affect your ability to understand the word, I don't think. Okay, now let's listen for this woman. Okay, now finally we need to think about how the room is used. I'll have to talk to the teachers and make sure we can all reach some agreement on a timetable to supervise the centre after class. But we also need to think about security too. Okay. After class, after class, okay, coming through as a nasal, nasal um, accent, and it would naturally be security, security. As Australians will say security, but she's been told by the uh, IELTS examiners to dumb it down and say security. Okay, now um, listen for the way the student says this word. Can you guess how he's going to say it according to an Australian accent? Especially if we're going to invest in some new equipment. Um, what about putting in an alarm? Good idea. An alarm. Okay, very nasal and also this R sound. Alarm. Okay, R. Good. Okay, so there you've got the stronger Australian accent. Now let's go on to the South African um, accent. Okay, so we're listening to the woman up here and she's talking about um, types of lions in India. Well... Most people think that lions only come from Africa. And you would be forgiven for thinking this, because in fact, most lions do come from Africa. Okay, um, so British English would be Africa, um, but the A sound in South African accent is E. So Africa, Africa, not Africa, Africa. So you'll listen to it when you hear her say Af Africa. Again. In fact, I don't think it comes up again. So let's listen one more time. Well... Most people think that lions only come from Africa. And you would be forgiven for thinking this, because in fact, most lions do come from Africa. Okay, so Africa. And then another note, a thing that South Africans will do is sometimes shorten diphthongs. Now, a diphthong is the sound like A, I, O. So, lie, lions, I sound, lions. What the South Africans will do is tend to shorten the word. So it's not lions, it's lions, lions. It's almost like it's a, not a diphthong, but a single vowel. Ah, lions, lions. Okay, so they do become a lot shorter, some of the words. Um, listen out for it again. But this hasn't always been the case. If we go back 10,000 years, we would find... Okay, to listen to that. Not years, but years. Not years, but years. Okay, so they do tend to shorten the vowel, the long vowels and the diphthongs into shorten, shorter, um, shorter words. Find that there were lions roaming vast sections of the globe. Okay, there's another example. Not vast, but vast. Vast in British English, vast in South African. But now, unfortunately, only very small sections of the lion's former habitat remain. My particular interest is Asiatic lions, which are a subspecies of African lions. It's almost a hundred thousand years since the Asiatic lion split off and developed as a subspecies. At one time, the Asiatic lion was living as far west as Greece, and they were found from there in a band that spread east through various countries of the Middle East all the way to India. In museums, you can now see Greek coins that have clear images of the Asiatic lion on them. Okay, and the last thing is not, it's um, images, not images, images, images. 
Okay, now New Ze the New Zealand accent apparently is very similar to the South African accent, and I've got a little star here because in this um, audio he's supposed to be a scientist from New Zealand, but my my hunch is that this is actually a New Z um, an Australian man who's trying to put on a New Zealand accent. So it's not a very good example of a New Zealand accent. It's not. It's more close to Australian. Um, but we'll listen to it anyway, so let's just go. What is it actually like at the South Pole? I know you've been there on a number of occasions. Yes, I have. And each time I'm struck by the awesome beauty of the place. OK, so we've got that Australian thing. And I don't know if the New Zealanders do this as well, but there again, that's the vowel sound here and another vowel sound. When I say vowel sound, I don't mean this is a vowel. It's a consonant. But if you listen to it, T, beauty, E, E is a vowel sound. So he doesn't say beauty, he says beauty, beauty. Awesome beauty of the place, which is a very Australian accent, and that's why I think this might not be a very good example. It's magnificent, but you can really only visit it in the summer months. Visit it, visit it in the summer months. October to March. Yes, because it's completely dark for four months of the year. And in addition... It has to be the coldest place on Earth. Okay, so, and let's just listen to the second bit. When was that exactly? In 1870. Okay, so not 1870, but 1870. 1870, okay. And it was called the Polar Research Meeting. And then, not long after that, they organised something called the First International Polar Year. Okay, notice not international, but in an in an international. Let's listen to it again. They organized something called the first international polar year. And that took place when exactly? By the way, the interviewer is British speaking RP or BBC English. Okay, and the doctor, the last one, listen to the way he says these dates. Over two years from eighteen eighty two to eighteen eighty three. Eighteen eighty. Not 1880, 1880, 1883. Okay. But it wasn't until the 1950s that the idea of an international treaty was proposed. Okay, listen for the way he says this word, treaty. Again, because of that rule um, of the T falling between two vowels. And in 1959, the treaty was actually signed. Treaty was actually signed. Okay. Right, let's move on now to Amer the American accent. And as I said, this makes up quite a significant proportion. Okay, in this case, I've used um, just a single example by a woman, simply because she's got um, a lot of her, a lot of the words and phrases that are used here are good examples of the the difference between the baseline BBC or RP English and American English. So we'll stop it quite regularly to um, highlight the words that are different. Now, let's consider two types of mistake that can occur when a manager actually starts to set up a duplicate system to replicate a successful process. Okay, there's two things I want to talk about quickly here. First of all, consider, we spoke about this, can occur, consider, occur. Um, this is very typical in Irish English as well. And um, in the 20 exams I studied, I didn't hear anybody with an Irish accent. But a lot of people, uh, linguists, um, believe that the American accent started from the Irish accent. So if you understand the American accent, you shouldn't have any trouble understanding a weaker or less strong version of an Irish accent. Okay, and the second thing is this word. In British English, we would say process, process, but she says process. Listen. Firstly, perhaps he forgets that he was just trying to copy another process and starts trying to improve on it. Another mistake is trying to use the best parts of various different systems in the hope of creating the perfect combination. Unfortunately, 
Attempts like these usually turn out to be misguided and lead to problems. Why? Well, for various reasons. Perhaps there weren't really any advantages after all, because the information wasn't accurate. Or perhaps the business settings weren't really... Okay, here, settings is a much more common way of the Americans to say. Business settings, settings, like the Australians will do. But she's been told clearly by the IELTS examiners or the IELTS exam setter to make sure she says settings and not settings. Okay, but bear in mind that typically Americans will say settings and not settings. Okay, let me just go back again and listen to that. Because the information wasn't accurate. Or perhaps the business settings weren't really comparable. Okay, now listen to the way that she says this word in British English. It would be comparable, comparable. See, um, sorry, uh, four, sorry, five syllables. Comparable. But in American English, this is only th three syllables. Comparable, comparable. Okay, let's continue. More typically, the advantages are real enough, but there are also disadvantages that have been overlooked. For example, the modifications might compromise safety in some way. So, what's the solution? Well, I don't intend to suggest that it's easy to get things right the second time. It's not. But the underlying problem has more to do with attitudes. Okay, now in this case, she's allowed her American accent to slip out. Before, she was told to say settings, but why she says attitude, why she says attitudes instead of attitudes um, is an example where it doesn't make sense. And this, again, makes me think that perhaps this is not an American speaking. It could be a British person trying to do an American accent. Um, and she's got it right here, but she forgot, she, she forgot to do it there. Or maybe, as I said, the examiner, um, the exam setters forced her to say business settings because that might be the answer, in fact, and that's why she has to say it clearly. Okay, so just listen to the way she says attitudes again. But the underlying problem has more to do with attitudes than the actual difficulty of the task, and there are ways of getting it right. Okay, also we would say task in British English, are, a car, task. Americans will say task, task. These involve adjusting attitudes, first of all. Okay, again, we've got this attitudes, first of all. Being more realistic and cautious, really. Okay, again, this sound in British English, cautious. In American English, cautious. Or becomes ah. Or becomes ah. Secondly, they involve exerting strict controls on the organizational and operational systems. And this, in turn, means copying the original as closely as possible. Not merely duplicating the physical characteristics of the... Okay, um, so those are the, the, the main things for American English. So the, a few of the vowel shifts there, as well as the fact that the er at the end of the of a word is pronounced and the T sound is often becomes a D sound between two vowels. There are a few other things but um, they don't really uh, affect your ability to understand the words. Right now we're going to be looking at the non-English section and this typically comes up in section one sometimes in section uh, three. So section one typically is when somebody will phone in and they might be a foreign student. And in section three, often that's uh, two or even three people talking, sometimes even four people talking. Um, and they use, um, remember there's only, they can only use a male and a female to differentiate who's talking. But if you've got four people or three people, you might have to use something very different to differentiate who's talking and what they will sometimes do is use an accent. So what we're going to be listening to now is an example from a section three where two people are talking uh, with their supervisor, two students, 
and the way we can tell, tell who's talking is because of their accent. Okay, so we were looking at um, students who are supposedly Greek and Japanese. Now I say supposedly because, as I said before, these are simply English speakers putting on an accent and unfortunately not particularly um, convincingly. Um, it's very clear that it's an English person trying to put on an accent and it's, it's quite embarrassing and I'm sorry that if you are from any of these groups of people, Greek, Japanese, Chinese or German, um, I'm very sorry for forcing you to listen to this because it's really bad, but anyway, that's what the IELTS do sometimes. Okay, so we'll be focusing on this one, the Greek and the Japanese, for section three. Um, I think that having to do a seminar presentation really helped me. For example, a couple of weeks ago in our marketing subject, when it was my turn to give a presentation, I felt quite confident. Of course, I was still nervous, but because I had done one before, I knew what to expect. Mm. Also, I know I was well prepared, and I had practiced my timing. In fact, I think that in relation to some of the other people in my group, I did quite a good job, because my overall style was quite professional. What about you, Hiroko? Okay, so uh, this is the Englishman trying to pretend to, well, to be Southern European. And um, the real difference here is that the R, the rhotic R, r right, remember, becomes um, a, a sort of, r, 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 I don't know how, a rolled R, I don't know how to say it exactly, but that's really what, they're tr what this man is trying to do. Anyway, it shouldn't, um, it shouldn't stop you from understanding the words that he's using there. Listen for the Japanese, supposedly the Japanese student. Mm, that's interesting. In my group, I was really surprised by the way the students did their presentations. They just read their notes aloud. Can you believe that? They didn't worry about their presentation style or keeping eye contact with their audience. And I remember that these things were really stressed to us in the course here. Okay. Um, poor quality Japanese accent. In my group, um, I don't know, it's it's a stereotypical Japanese accent, but hopefully it wasn't too difficult for you to understand what she was saying. I'm not going to analyse this because it's just badly done, um, but just get used to this. It could possibly come up in the exam. Okay, now we'll move on to supposedly somebody from China. And this is part one. Um, and part one is, this is more common to have these... Um, attempts at doing foreign accents by English speakers. Um, so be aware of it, it might come up right at the beginning of the exam. Um, Sarah, what's your full name? Sarah Lim. And that's Sarah without the H at the end. Mm -hmm. How old are you, Sarah? 23, only just. It was my birthday on the 21st of August. Oh, happy birthday for yesterday. How long have you been in Australia? A year in Adelaide and six months in Sydney. I prefer Sydney. I've got more friends here. What's your address at your aunt's house? Flat 1, 539 Forest Road, Canterbury. And the postcode is 2036. Okay, so um, this shouldn't bother you too much with uh, the accent. Um, especially in part one. Part one, um, they they will not force you to try and understand a very strong accent. Um, now, this last one here with the supposedly German accent, you will notice that all the answers in the exam, um, you can't notice it here because you can't see it, but I can tell you that all the answers for the exam are raised by the organizer and not the student because this student has got a supposedly a very strong accent, a poorly done English speaking attempt at a German accent. But because it's such a, in inverted commas, strong accent, none of these, uh, none of the things that he say says um, uh, come up in the answers in the exam itself. So let's just get used to it, listen. And what visits are planned for this term? 
Right. Well, I'm afraid the schedule hasn't been printed out yet, but、uh, we have confirmed the dates and planned the optional extra visits, which you can also book in advance if you want to. Oh, that's all right.、Um, if you can just give some idea of the weekend ones, so I can, you know, work out when to see friends, etc. Oh, sure. Well,、uh, the first one is St Ives. That's on the thirteenth of February, and we'll have only sixteen places available because、uh, we're going by minibus. And that's a day in town with the optional extra of visiting the Hepworth Museum. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so、uh, you can hear that the student's supposed accent is quite strong. He says things like "work out when to see my friends."、Um, again, embarrassing, and I'm sorry if you are German listening to this. But、um, as I said, you don't need to worry about the very strong accents coming up as answers. This is very unlikely to ever require you. To、um, understand the the accent of strong accents, you're really listening for the woman who's got a more standard British English accent. Okay, so I hope that was useful for you.、Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Again, you can write the questions in the Q and A on Udemy itself or on the Reddit page for this. Learner training video. Okay, so thank you.